creatures like these ruled the Earth for 120 million years. Dinosaurs. It was a violent age, blood red in tooth and claw. But how dinosaurs actually fought remains a mystery. Perhaps these hold the answer. Dinosaur tracks frozen in stone and in time. 60 years ago, a paleontologist believed these tracks signified the greatest find of the century. A fossil record of dinosaurs locked in a life and death encounter. But fellow scientists said no, the tracks showed no evidence of combat. Now, a paleontologist and a sculptor have plunged into the controversy. Their plan, to test the theory using the latest in computer technology. But can computers really show us the ferocity and terror of a dinosaur attack? It's painstaking work, the minute examination of fossils, the remains of creatures that lived tens of millions of years ago. This is modern paleontology. Yet work like this tells us precious little about how dinosaurs actually lived. We know they had teeth, but how did they use them? We know they had eyes, but how did they see? But how did they kill? The two men in this pickup aim to find out. They are possibly the most unlikely team in modern dinosaur science. Jim Farlow is a professor at Indiana Purdue University. He's one of America's most highly respected paleontologists. But his partner is a different species altogether. Dave Thomas is a professional sculptor, and he specializes in crafting scientifically accurate, life-size reproductions of just one kind of animal, dinosaurs. Barlow and Thomas hope to solve one of modern paleontology's most enduring mysteries, how dinosaurs fought. And the secret, they believe, lies in the footprints that dinosaurs left behind. It's interesting that we know very little about so many features about what dinosaurs were like when they were alive, and even what we know about their movements, it's partly based on trying to understand how the joints and the skeletons work, but uh, the footprints tell us an awful lot about that. They, they really do. All other fossils are corpses, but footprints were made by a living animal, and that's why I really love to study them. The dinosaur detectives are on a mission. They plan to bring to life a dinosaur attack based on footprint data alone. To help them in their quest, they've approached a group of computer animators with a daunting challenge. To create a 3D animation of the dinosaurs in combat. Dave Thomas hopes the animation will bring lifelike movement to a scene that hitherto he could only imagine. The beauty of the computer graphics is that I can't let anybody else see what's in my head. And a computer, with a computer you can do it so you can put it on a screen and other people can see it too. Barlow and Thomas are heading for one of the prime track sites in America. The state park at Glen Rose, Texas is a well-known beauty spot. Tourists come here from all over America, but the winding river valley and rolling hills of Glen Rose hold a deep secret, which until relatively recently had lain hidden for over a hundred million years. Back then, in what geologists call the early Cretaceous period, Glen Rose was a very different place. 
tourists, if they existed, have had to run for their lives. Look, that guy, it just moved! <laughs> But 60 years ago, one man unearthed the secret of Glen Rose, quite literally. Dinosaur hunter Roland T. Bird, known to family and colleagues alike as R.T., spent most of the 1930s roaming around the southern United States. His job, to find fossils and to ship them back east to the American Museum of Natural History in New York. But in 1938, R.T. Bird struck the mother load and he took his own movie camera to record the scene. Here at Glen Rose, stamped into the bed of the Paluxy River, were hundreds of fossilized tracks made by giant four-footed plant eaters known as sauropods. It was a virtual dinosaur freeway. The story quickly became front page news. The little town of Glen Rose changed overnight, as a long-time resident remembers, Jeannie Mack. Everybody went out there to see what was going on. You know, it was curious. It was a big thing to dig up those dinosaur tracks. I thought the river had washed them out, made tracks. Well, all through here, there, was lo there were trails, and I don't know whether they're still there or not, for I haven't been down there but there used to be long trails all through the, uh, the uh, riverbed, and you always wondered what they were. And I remember seeing the dinosaur tracks, but I never given a thought about an animal making them. I just thought the river washed them. Jeannie Mack now runs the town museum, where she still cherishes memories of the time a little girl met the dinosaur hunter from New York, Roland T. Bird. I spoke to him offered him cookies that we'd made. I made, I had made cookies shaped like dinosaur tracks. You know, took a tin and bent it all in, then cut them out when you made the dough. I made big plates full of them. Bird himself was profoundly moved by the discovery, as his letters from the time reveal. His relatives still read them today with a certain sense of awe. Suddenly, filled with a wild thrill that I hardly dared to accept, I got up and looked around. A full 12 feet away was another pothole. It, too, was a gigantic footprint. There come rare moments in the lives of all of us when we see things we do not actually believe. I began to think in terms of what I knew it must be. It could only be, in fact, a giant sauropod. According to R.T.'s nephew, Robert, the dinosaur trackway turned out to be the peak of Bird's career. His response was, was almost immediate excitement because he recognized that the brontosaurus or the brontosaurus type track had not been found to date. He was specifically looking for odd tracks, not the run of the mill. And, um, and from that moment, he developed ideas, he, he excavated more, he was trying to get more interest in it, he wrote articles about it eventually. His reactions were, it was, it was exciting. And um, he lived on excitement, I think. <laughs> Bird shipped the bulk of the trackway here to the American Museum of Natural History in New York, where it's still on display. His connection with Glen Rose might have ended there, but one day he took another look at the footprints, and what he found astonished him. Off to one side was a smaller set of prints in a convergent relationship to the main trackway. Another dinosaur, a predator, was stalking the main herd, and from the course the footprints took, Bird reasoned, the loner had singled out a target. Until Bird's discovery, paleontologists believed dinosaurs fought each other face to face, slugging it out like heavyweight boxers. But Bird's scenario was different. His dinosaurs looked more like modern predators, hunting big game on the plains of Africa.
When Bird tried to present his theory, he met skepticism. Fellow scientists said the two sets of tracks were made at different times, that dinosaurs didn't move in the way Bird's theory suggested. Nevertheless, even late in life, as his health began to fail, Bird never gave up on the idea. I remember visiting him at his house at about the time he was really suffering from ill health. And he was really badly off uh, when he had a visit with an old friend of his from Arizona, days of excavating um, in Arizona. Uh, she helped him back to health, to a fair degree of health through a change in diet. And once he had that extra energy, what did he do? But he started reconstructing this trackway around his house through molds and casts that he had stored or had available somehow. And um, it showed that he was continuing his interest in paleontology, in these tracks in particular. R.T. Bird died in 1978. His dinosaur attack theory remains unproven. Jim Farlow and Dave Thomas have come back to see what remains of Bird's great discovery and to test the theory that grew from it. Like Bird, Farlow and Thomas can see life in the footprints of dinosaurs. They've brought a life-size replica of the likely predator back to its old stomping ground to see if its face, and more importantly, its foot, fits. But how did the trackway come to be made in the first place? And what were the animals that made them really like? This is what dinosaur detectives Jim Farlow and Dave Thomas have come to see. Fossilized footprints of the Paluxy River in the town of Glen Rose, Texas. The trackway itself has long gone, shipped off to museums by dinosaur hunter R.T. Bird. But dozens of individual prints still remain. This is your first time here at the park? Yeah, it's, I've studied it for years, but just in uh, pictures and maps and things. Well, you can see there are a lot of really pretty theropod oh, prints. Oh, gorgeous. Like, look okay. at that one For right Farlow and it's Thomas, kind of these holes in the ground reveal yeah, much about spot. the animals that made them. Right. Here's a nice left in the same animal. He's walking kind of pigeon toed. Mm -hmm. This is a particularly nice footprint. It's got a nice three toed shape. And you can get some idea of how soft and gooey the mud was when the beast went through because you can see in several places when the toes were picked up, the mud kind of collapsed, roofing over the toe mark a little bit, making these kind of little toe tunnels like you see there. And the, the toe will sometimes extend quite a distance. Ahead yeah, from looking at three-toed footprints like this, you can tell quite a bit about the animals that made the prints. You can get some idea of how they carried their weight as they were walking on their feet. You can get some idea of their gait from looking at the sequence of footprints one after another. For example, in bipedal dinosaurs, they move in a manner so that they put one foot right in front of the other. They were a very narrow, efficient, striding kind of gait. And you can make some inferences about how fast they might have been going from the size of the footprint and the spacing between the footprints. Because when you think about it, um, if the animal is just walking slowly, no particular hurry, it's going to put the feet fairly close together. Whereas if it's running, it's apt to put the feet farther apart. Footprints like this look an awful lot like footprints of big birds. And in fact, the first Anglo settlers in this area who found these things thought these were turkey tracks. But you can tell from the size uh, this would have been poultry on a scale that Colonel Sanders would have found ravishing to contemplate. Oh, that is a really nice print. Mm -hmm. What I really like about this one, it's a left print and it shows some really Follow characteristic Paulo and Thomas began features, sharing like their knowledge of dinosaur the tracks toe, with the computer it, animators. There's a kind of a boundary back but here. such knowledge yeah, meant little come back until the animators first solved the outer a fundamental does. problem. Right. And so they aren't How working dinosaurs entirely move. symmetrically. What we needed to do in order to get some idea of the way the uh, animals, the prehistoric animals may have moved, is to look to, at animals that are similar 
um, that are around every day that we can see, look at videotapes of, say, elephants or giraffes or uh, crocodiles. Um, and by looking at them and comparing skeletons, we can come up with similar sort of approaches to the way they must have moved. Dan Seely sent fellow animator Jason Giles to visit a nearby ostrich farm. Here, Giles found striking parallels in the movements of the big birds and the theropod tracks found at Glen Rose. Carnivorous dinosaurs, it seems, walked like ostriches. But the predator involved in the Glen Rose attack was no ostrich. Indeed, the beast was so monstrous, it was literally out of this world. It means high-spined lizard, Acrocanthosaurus, a monster from hell that Hearty Bird came to believe made the predator tracks at Glen Rose. The discovery of Acrocanthosaurus bone fragments near the track site, itself an unusual find, convinced Bird that this was the perpetrator of the attack. Acrocanthosaurus is so rare that only one skeleton exists in the whole world. It's been in deep storage for years, until staff at the Museum of Natural Sciences in Raleigh, North Carolina, assembled it especially for this program. Their efforts were guided by paleontologist and self-confessed acro-nut, Dale Russell. Acrocanthosaurus was aptly called the terror of the South. Here we see it, the whole skeleton put together again, and have an image of the dinosaur as a whole organism. This was a serious carnivorous dinosaur, and it was not small. The animal was on the order of 38 feet long, 11 and a half feet high, the head was four and a half feet long, and it was at least the second largest meat-eating dinosaur that we know of that inhabited North America. The main offensive weapon of the Acrocanthosaurus was, of course, its skull. Uh, but however, it used its body and its limbs to support the skull in an attack situation so that the animal was holding on to its victim uh, with its claws, which were very articulate and very large. This animal was a bulldog. It cut and sliced and ripped flesh away from the animal it was attacking. But even the mighty Acrocanthosaurus was not without its shortcomings. When you look at the size of its chest, you see the chest is narrow. And this suggests that the animal uh, was uh, attacking uh, without breathing, that it was working on the chemical energy stored within its muscles rather than its breathing. So it was running on an anaerobic rather than an aerobic metabolism. Back in the graphics lab, the animators fed all these parameters into the computer. And this is what they came up with, a vicious carnivore with strong arms, jaws and teeth. But it can't run and breathe at the same time. It's built for enormous energy expenditure in short bursts. And that means no long battles, but closing slowly on its prey and then savagely striking. Marathon battles are out. Now, Farlo and Thomas must determine the identity of the victim. The answer lies all around in the large potholes which dot the bed of the Paluxy River. Wait a minute. The dinosaur detectives plunge back into the investigation. The potholes are fossilized footprints made by something very, very large. These are the fossilized footprints of a walking meal in Cretaceous times. They were made by giant four-footed dinosaurs known as sauropods. The term sauropod is used to describe the, the big, long-necked, relatively small-headed, quadrupedal, plant-eating dinosaurs. The sauropod footprints, when they're very well preserved, you're going to get a kind of U-shaped or horseshoe-shaped impression from the front foot and then immediately behind it there will be uh, a fairly long and broad 
kind of oval shaped hind foot impression with claw marks that are directed out to the side. Unfortunately, most of the time you see them here in the river. They're just great big oblong depressions. And if you see an impression of the front foot, it's this little squashed little crescent thing at the front end. This is the classic image of the sauropod. Four heavy legs, a long neck with small head, and a long tail. Its name, Apatosaurus. But the tracks bird found did not match the feet of this massive creature. They belonged instead to a much rarer beast, a sauropod so rare that only fragments of its skeleton have ever been found. Here at the Texas Memorial Museum in Austin is the largest of those fragments, a right rear foot, almost complete. The name of the rare specimen this foot belongs to, Pleurocelus. Assuming that the prints here in the river were made by Pleurocelus, and that is an assumption, we don't know that for a fact. It's simply that Pleurocelus has been found in rocks comparable in these to age in the same geographic region, so it's a nice bet. Um, the footprints of the front foot don't have any trace of a claw mark, and that's unlike some sauropod prints that have been found elsewhere. And the other characteristic thing about these prints is they have a very wide uh, gauge, if you will. The footprints of the left side are well apart from footprints of the right side. And it's been presumed uh, that this might be a feature of titanosaurid sauropods like Pleurocelus, because you can see in the, in the shape of the, of the thigh bone, there's a kind of a kink at the upper end that would put the hind foot some distance away from the midline that way. I think this is the main track layer, Dave. Watch yourself. Right. Whoa, 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 whoa. Hey. There you go, there's one of them, the sauropod track there, I think. Yeah. But I think the I'm creatures be, that made and, these and footprints here, defied nature. Uh, yeah, let's, let's get out to the side. The tracks so describe their dimensions. 50 to 60 you, feet long, way, each way. foot making there's a print the size of a bathtub. You notice how wide they are, the yeah. wide distance The depth of the prints in the stone reveals a massive weight, perhaps as much as 29 tons, by, uh, almost 70,000 pounds. Been made by a titanosaurid like Pleurocelus. Yet yeah. Pleurocelus didn't use but water to support that too, weight. It? Uh -huh. it lived in the shallows and on dry land. Cleaned it already. Yeah. And crucially for birds' attack scenario, sauropods like Pleurocelus so walked right. not like lizards, right. but like yeah. mammals. I think he's going this way. Yeah, they walk like mammals do today. That is, they lead with the hind foot on one side, follow with the front foot on that same side, and then do the reverse, back and forth. And this means that both feet on one side are off the ground at the same time. So that when the foot, like that, so that the hind foot can come down in the track that was left by the front foot. And in that series we, of uh, tracks we went through, in every case the hind foot had obliterated, completely erased the track left by the front foot. Before Bird, scientists believe sauropods walked with the sprawling gait of crocodiles. The trackway at Glen Rose established that sauropods walked like elephants, with their feet planted directly beneath the body, supporting their weight. But look at the stiff-legged gait that results. Other modern quadrupeds bend their spines as they run. The flexibility generates speed. Elephants can't do this. Nor could Pleurocelus. Its way of walking meant a top speed of just four miles per hour. If Pleurocelus could have moved faster, it might have got away. So what was it that brought Pleurocelus and Acrocanthosaurus to their fateful encounter at Glen Rose? And how did their footprints come to survive intact for over 100 million years? To find out, we must leave Farlow and Thomas in Glen Rose and go on a trip back through time. A 
100 million years ago, the Earth was a strange and alien planet. Most of Texas was underwater. Where Glen Rose stands today ran the shoreline of a vast inland sea, a sea which divided North America in two. This is how the area around the dinosaur track where Glen Rose might have looked a hundred million years ago. No valley, no hills, just a lush tangle of hothouse vegetation by an inland sea. And in the shallows, lumber giant sauropods. In some forgotten corners of America, you can still see some of the features of a dinosaur landscape. This is the Cape Fear River, North Carolina. To the casual eye, it's a beautiful yet forbidding place. But to paleontologist Dale Russell, it's a living reminder of what prehistoric America must have been like. The general climatic conditions were intensely hot. Uh, the trees themselves, the foliage was very thick, rough. Um, the plants um, were often low to the ground. I think that it would be like in tropical Africa today, where the light wouldn't seem uh, like it was producing all the heat, but the radiation from the sun would almost be like x-rays passing through us. I think the heat and the humidity would be very difficult for us to support. Sauropods thrived in such conditions. Ball cypresses, ferns, magnolias, these provided their staple diet. But surprisingly for such large creatures, they didn't eat all that much. The interesting thing that we find when we calculate the plant requirements, the food requirements of dinosaurs is, is they're almost exactly the same as mammals that are much smaller in body size. However, the size of these animals was several times. They were on the order of 10 times or more heavier. The heaviest elephants, I suppose, are on the range of uh, 10,000 pounds, roughly, and these sauropods were on the order of 65,000 pounds, and they were eating as much as an elephant would. So the immediate effect visual effect of seeing those animals would be that it's impossible. They cannot possibly find enough sustenance here. Russell reveals vital clues about the way sauropods like Pleurocelus were built. They may have walked like mammals, but they shared at least one characteristic with lizards. They were cold-blooded. Their metabolism was determined not by how much they ate, but by sunlight and ambient temperature. They got their nutrition from food, but not their energy. That meant animals like Pleurocelus couldn't regulate their own body temperature. Sauropods didn't sweat. To cool off in the intense heat, Pleurocelus needed to be near water. And that's why they used the beach as a freeway. Living in the environment they did, they were almost certainly thermally stressed. And the easiest way, if you don't sweat, to cool off is to get wet and let the water evaporate on the surface of your body. It was the beach-type terrain which allowed the footprints to be captured and preserved. Well, you can see that this is very soft sediment, and it holds the form of an impression very well. When the sauropod stepped into this substrate, it left a very clear image of both its track and its foot shape. And what happened in this substrate, this sediment, um, which was permeated with calcium carbonate, it was slightly raised above sea level, and then it set like concrete. And then it slightly fell below sea level, but by that time it had turned to effectively turned to stone. And for 110 million years, that footprint held its shape until it was discovered just a few decades ago. Over millions of years, both the footprint and the lighter sediment overlaying it would have turned to stone. It was the top layer of fossilized sediment which the Paluxy River eroded, revealing the footprints intact. And it's the footprints that hold the key to the mystery. 
They explain how a predator can make an attack on prey five times bigger and ten times heavier. This is where dinosaur sculptor Dave Thomas works. It's where he's created some of the most accurate and fearsome replicas of dinosaurs ever made. But today, his partner, Jim Farlow, has brought a special artifact for Thomas to see. A copy of the original chart that dinosaur hunter R.T. Bird made of the Glen Rose trackway. There's a lot of it. The chart is 26 feet long. It's this sequence of prints that describes the chase sequence as Bird saw it. And um, there are a number of interesting things that you can see in this chart. One of the things I did. Bird's was theory was controversial around. because he saw an interaction in the footprints of the predator dinosaur and its giant prey. Fellow scientists argue that the two sets of tracks were made at different times. But controversial or not, Jim Farlow believes Bird had it right. First of all, in addition to both trackways making a gradual bend to the left and a, and a first order change of direction, if you will, superimposed on that you have some second order slight changes in direction, you know, wiggles along the main path, and both trackways make those at about the same point. And it's hard for me to visualize why the two trails would be doing that if the animals were not making them about the same time. If you kind of visualize the animals standing in their prints, how big the animal would be relative to the way that the footprints are drawn there, it looks like, to my eye at least, as though the carnivore is as close to the sauropod as it can possibly be without physically colliding with it. And it maintains that distance for Dave Thomas, the message in the tracks that. looks First very all, familiar. It seems to me that this indicates, or is consistent with, does not indi indicate, but is consistent with a, a strategy that modern predators use, which is to keep the prey bleeding and keep it moving, and sooner or later it'll go down, especially on big prey. The hunting methods of modern-day big cats do seem to echo those of the predator dinosaur Acrocanthosaurus. Look at the harmony of movement between hunter and hunted, jinking left and right in perfect unison. Look at the close proximity between predator and prey. Movements similar to these show up in the fossilized footprints at Glen Rose, but a lot bigger and a lot slower. To back up this point, Thomas takes Farlow to the site in Albuquerque of his earlier sculptures, the New Mexico Museum of Natural History. As a sculptor, Thomas feels he has something many scientists do not have, the eyes of an artist. This, I got this pose actually from an elephant that was uh, circling to its left. It had been spooked by a hot air balloon and was trying to see it. And it was turning I look at things from a different angle. The, the paleontologists are making the measurements, they're doing the fine tuning. I'm coming in and trying to see it as a real living animal. And, and I, so I see things differently. I'm looking for, at a different angle. And uh, I think in this particular case, I saw that the two animals were in the same rhythm for 20 consecutive steps. And this started me thinking rhythm, because they're both moving at the same step, the same pace. The predator can reach out and strike very precisely. And then I decided to see if modern predators availed themselves of this technique, and I find yes, they do. It looks to me like this particular footprint is The chart where begins to reveal the secrets side. of the attack, the speed of the animals, and the brevity of the encounter. This was no slugging match of movie dinosaurs, but a surgical hit. We have just a flash in time, a brief uh, glimpse here. We don't know what happened before, and we don't have any idea what happened after. But then, a mystery. 
one of the tracks in the middle of the sequence made by the predator is missing. Did the hunter take a leap before striking? Bird thought it did. Like this lion attacking a wildebeest, the predator dinosaur physically grabbed the sauropod's rear end. By doing so, the predator was dragged off its feet and forced to make a hop. Bird actually left notes where he indicated what he thought was happening at various points along the trail. In his scenario, the carnivore was trying to grab the sauropod right here, and in his actual words here, the charging carnosaur runs up with weight on its toes. Here, he thought the carnivore had actually gripped the tail of the sauropod, digging in its heels, and again, to quote what he wrote, carnosaur sinks teeth into brontosaur's left rump, attempts to drag down victim, foot of the carnosaur penetrates deeply into the mud. But could a predator like Acrocanthosaurus lunge that way? Acro expert Dale Russell says yes. The beast was built for just such a maneuver. One of the striking attributes of Acrocanthosaurus is the strength of its forearm. It had a flexible forearm with large processes on it for muscles, and Acrocanthosaurus had an extremely powerful forelimb. It's small uh, in terms of length, but extremely thick and robust. And those arms are clearly strong enough to support um, the movement of an animal of that weight in attaching himself to a fleeing sauropod. But Jim Farlow is not convinced. He feels that hopping would show up in the footprints. Okay, well, one of the things that bothers me about the hop scenario, I think probably the thing that bothers me most about the hop scenario, is what happens here when he comes down at the end of the hop on his right foot. Acrocanthosaurus is an animal that's probably weighing, what, two or three tons as light. The animal is being pulled forward. That is a big animal going through the air in a manner where he can't control his motions for a moment. That right foot has to swing forward rapidly to catch himself That's so right. he doesn't do a massive belly flop here. Right. I would expect this to be the most hellaciously deformed footprint that you could imagine. I would expect an enormous slide mark as it's going in. I would expect the mud to be piled up huge rolls of mud squooshed in front of those toes as he's landing. I would expect the toes to go way down deep to have gone well past the actual limestone layer into the underlying, or the lime mud layer into the underlying clay rock. And then an immense drag mark as the toes are coming out again. And when you look at the footprint today, you look at birds' photos, there's none of that there. It looks like a normal footprint. Except that it comes in from the left like this, so it piled up a lot of mud on the right. It piled up a bit of mud. The hop frustrates the efforts to produce the first ever animation describing a dinosaur attack based on RT Bird's trackway data. It's all a matter of timing between footsteps, and right now, the animation just doesn't work. Computer animator Jason Giles goes back to basics. Using tin cans in his backyard, he lays out the pattern of the theropod tracks. He then walks himself through the sequence of steps over and over again. His aim to fix in his own mind what the left leg of Acrocanthosaurus was actually doing in the few seconds it was in the air. On the right. and For Thomas, the answer lies in the way modern animals move. Look at this cheetah stalking prey on the African savanna. Like an automobile, the cheetah builds up speed by stepping through the gears into first, and it's walking. Now into second, and it's trotting. Then straight into overdrive. Between trotting and running, it has no third gear. It cannot jog. Now compare the way this beagle moves. As the treadmill speeds up, he goes from walking to trotting. 
but now look at his hind legs. In the transition between trotting and running, the hind legs break step, but stay in rhythm. The hind legs, in effect, make a small hop. Harmonizing with the pace of the prey is essential for a successful kill. Maybe Acrocanthosaurus wasn't dragged into making a hop as bird would, but hopped first to get a better strike. It was a controlled move. One of the sauropod's footprints a few paces on supports this idea. A conspicuous toe drag indicates a sharp left turn. Let's put it down. Jim, you can do this so I won't put okay. my weight on that. Well, you might want just, just line up those toes. Okay. Kind of like that? Yeah. And we can see how much he's turned already. I believe the turn starts Carlo right and here. Thomas okay, measure well out now, the angle of get, turn. You've got another one of these things? The sauropod yes, must just, now be aware of the danger. It's swinging to the left. And crucially, that means its tail is swinging out to the right. It's getting ready to strike the predator a blow that would knock it into the next county. That Acrocanthosaurus isn't full. The predator hops and strikes before the tail can be brought to bear. He strikes here. This is the first, he's, the Carnosaur waits until this foot is fully planted and his leftward motion is gone. The Sauropod turned left there to try to extend that motion to use his only weapon, which is his, his great weight, but it didn't work. The Carnosaur was not fooled. He hit after the motion stopped, and that accounts for the dr foot drag here. This kind of precision hunting requires special equipment. Nature has given modern predators like big cats a precious gift, specialized vision. Their eyes are highly sensitive to distance and movement over a wide angle of view. But did predator dinosaurs have a similar kind of eyesight? Conventional paleontology can't answer that question. There are no remains of dinosaur eyes. Their brains and central nervous systems have forever perished. But this man is anything but conventional. At Oregon University, Professor Kent Stevens believes there is a way we can learn about dinosaur vision, by examining their skulls. This is a cast of Allosaurus. It's a similar sort of a theropod to Acrocanthosaurus. Uh, very light in construction. These are the nostrils here, and this hole here is actually where the eye would be. And you can see it's, it's a narrow design. Let me show you a life reconstruction here that shows the eyes in place. And we have good reason to believe that the eyes had their finest detail vision, not pointing ahead, but off to the side. And it's reminiscent of, say, a robin that's when it's interested in something in the ground, it cocks its head over to the side in order to look with its detailed vision at what it's interested in. So I think that Acrocanthosaurus probably shared that characteristic. When you take the vision from the left eye and from the right eye, it covered the horizon. But ahead of it, it had a very narrow area where it saw with both left and right eyes simultaneously, binocular vision. That's important to know because in binocular vision, one of the main reasons for that is to be able to get depth perception, to get the range to your target. Big cats have a wide field of binocular vision, up to 130 degrees. That means they can judge the movement, distance, and speed of animals all around them to a high degree of accuracy. They live in a 3D world. But Acrocanthosaurus, had a very narrow field of binocular vision, around 25 degrees. Today, birds of prey, like these vultures, have the most advanced sight in the animal world. They use a kind of bifocal vision, 
wide peripheral sight with a magnified area in the center. Anything entering this area is in the target zone. Evolution has meant that vultures contain their sophisticated optical system within the eye. But did the position of its eye on the side of the head mean Acrocanthosaurus saw the world in a similar way? Did the predator dinosaur use a central area of vision not to magnify, but to measure the distance to its next meal? It seems an unlikely place for making dinosaur history. Sitting above a bicycle shop in Boulder, Colorado, a small computer graphics studio. But it's here that the first ever 3D animation of a dinosaur attack based on the vision and science of deceased paleontologist Roland T. Bird is finally completed. The months of preparation are over at last. So, who won the battle? That's the $64,000 question. The evidence shows that the, that the predator dinosaur made a pretty good hit on the prey dinosaur. So we, we think with pretty good certainty that he inflicted some damage. And we think that there's a good chance that uh, he may have had his supper that night. It's the moment of truth. Dan Seeley rolls the tape. And before our eyes, an astonishing scene. The attack comes in four phases. First, the theropod, Acrocanthosaurus, stalks its victim, Pleurocelus, from behind. The predator senses its prey plans a turn to the left. Turn the bring the victim's powerful tail into play. The predator adjusts his position via the hop and makes a vicious strike. The sauropod next begins a swing to the right, threatening to overturn the predator. Acro is forced to let go. What happens next is anyone's guess. The footprints disappear under the side of the valley. But the outcome seems inevitable. When Acrocanthosaurus bit a prey animal, of course the teeth sank deeply into its body and it probably yanked its teeth into, in the wound uh, so that it cut it uh, fore and aft and ripped flesh within it. Uh, it also has serrated teeth and bacteria probably inhabited uh, those minute crevices between the serrations so that it's highly likely uh, that the prey were infected uh, by bacteria. Uh, when the animal when it was bitten by an acrocanthosaur. So it's also likely that if it wasn't killed outright, uh, with the onset of infection, the prey animal would be weakened and probably recognized as a relatively easy prey sick animal um, if it did survive an initial attack. And remember, the sauropod was cold-blooded. As the sun went down, it would lose its main source of energy. When night fell, the weak of Pleurocelus would finally give up the ghost. It seems incredible that such giant beasts could be brought down by one brief assault, but it's possible. What is more certain is that dinosaur attacks involve precision strikes, not the epic wrestling matches of Godzilla or Lost World. But the scene would have had none of the elegance or grace of a modern predator attack. Quite the opposite. I think the, uh, the ugliness of the inevitability and the ponderousness of predator-prey interactions would be absolutely appalling uh, compared to the way the lion strikes a, a zebra or a um, uh, um, cheetah uh, attacks an impala. This was a drama that you could predict the conclusion to in, in, in minutes ahead of time. You knew how it was going to end. It was not a contest for us. Now, 
much it weighs. <laughs> yeah, I know. Yeah, it's kind of weighed a lot. Dave Thomas and his partner Jim Farlow have done more than anyone to keep alive the work of famous dinosaur hunter Roland T. Bird. But they have one bit of unfinished business left. They've got a dinosaur to erect, a fiberglass replica of Acrocanthosaurus, the predator that put this part of Texas on the map. I guess this is more, more in the nature of a, of a reunion than anything else here, taking the beast back to one of the places that made it famous. I feel like it's come home to where it belongs. But still, this is the spot that it came from, and I'm glad to get it back. What happened here at Glen Rose was an everyday occurrence 100 million years ago. The chances of such a scene surviving to the modern era, preserved intact, are billions to one. In 1938, Roland Bird had struck Paleolithic pay dirt. 60 years on, the world is only just beginning to notice.